All right, so um, we're still having some technical difficulties getting this video up on the web. Sorry. Um, I, but I, I want to re reemphasize, don't um, be self-conscious about asking questions because of that. You'll be edited out from any audio or video or whatever, so please ask a lot of questions. Um, I've written up some pretty complete lecture notes also, so I'll send out uh, a link to those. So last time uh, we were talking about uh, elliptic curves, and uh, I didn't quite finish uh, everything that I wanted to do. So we're going to start today talking about uh, elliptic curves over finite fields. And uh, as usual, I'm not going to give very complete proofs. So if you want to see more details, um, a good place to look is Silverman's book, and specifically chapter 5. Okay, so the first thing um, I want to do is point counting. So uh, for a little while, E is going to be an elliptic curve over FQ, where uh, Q is a power of uh, the prime P. So if you remember, we have the Frobenius map, which goes from E to its twist. And the way that this EQ was defined was by taking the defining equation for E and raising the coefficients to the qth power. Since E is defined over FQ, those coefficients, that means they live in FQ. And if you take something in FQ and raise it to the qth power, it doesn't do anything. So EQ is the same thing as E. So the Frobenius map is an endomorphism. Now if I have a point of E defined over FQ bar, uh, then in fact, E is defined over FQ if and only if it's invariant under Frobenius. That's just by Galois theory. Points defined over the base field if it's invariant under the Galois group, and the Galois group of the finite field is just generated by Frobenius. So this means that we can say that the set of FQ points of our curve E is a kernel of 1 minus Frobenius, or really. I want to think of 1 minus Frobenius as an isogeny from the thing to itself. So it's really the FQ points, FQ bar points of this kernel. So I mean. And so uh, a little lemma this map 1 minus FQ is separable. And the basic reason is. Remember, there was this test we did last time for separability. You can check if something's separable by pulling back and differential, a non-zero invariant differential, and seeing if the result is non-zero. And um, I said this last time that uh, the pullback, this kind of pullback thing, is linear or additive in these maps. So this is really the pullback by 1 minus the pullback by Frobenius. And then the pullback by 1 is yeah, then the, the pullback by Frobenius is zero, since Frobenius is not separable. So the result's not zero, so it's separable. And so since, since it's separable, we have this uh, property of separable isogenies that the size of their kernel uh, on actual points is equal to the degree. So as a corollary of this little lemma, we see that the number of points on E over FQ is equal to the degree of this isogeny, 1 minus FQ. Now I want you to recall that let me introduce this pairing. Uh, on and E by polarizing degree. And it was uh, positive definite. And sort of its defining property was that if you pair something with itself, you get degree. And so you can, I mean, ND is a free Z-module finite rank, so you can extend this R, linear, R linearly to the real vector space that it makes. Uh, and then you can uh, apply standard facts about positive definite pairings. So I'm going to use the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. So I'm going to look at the pairing between 1 and negative Frobenius. 
So if I take the value of the pairing and square it, Cauchy-Schwarz says that that's less than or equal to norm squared of 1 times norm, norm squared of fq. And these norms are just the degrees. And the degree of the identity is 1, and the degree of Frobenius is q. So that right-hand side is q. So in other words, uh, the absolute value of this pairing is at most root q. Now, if you remember the definition of the pairing, it was defined by the following um, formula. Twice it was equal to the degree of the sum minus the degree of each piece. And we know everything on the right-hand side. The first thing we just said was the number of points. And this thing is 1, this thing is q. So combining this formula, which is, you know, well, whatever, combining that with the Cauchy-Schwarz Cauchy -Schwarz inequality, we get a theorem, which is the Hasse bound. Uh, it es estimates the absolute value of this difference. It says that this thing is the absolute value of that, so it's at most 2 root q. Let me just uh, take a minute to sort of heuristically explain why you might expect a bound like this for those that haven't seen it before. If you think of an equation for E, y squared is x cubed plus ax plus b. So we're trying to find the number of solutions to this equation. So if you think about taking a, an element x and fq and plugging it into the right-hand side, you're going to get some, something out of it. You don't know anything about it, really. But half the elements in FQ are squares, and half are not squares. So if this thing behaved sort of randomly, you'd expect a 50-50 chance that there would be a y that solves it. And if there is a y that solves it, there will be another one, because there's plus y and negative y, except that you get 0, but you can ignore those, because there's only three zeros. So in other words, there's a 50% chance that you get two solutions, and a 50% chance you get zero solutions. So you expect the number of solutions to be the number of values of x, which is q. So this sort of heuristic says that you expect the number of points when you have fq to be approximately the size of fq, which is q. And the Hasse bound is telling you that the number of points is about q within an error of 2 root q. All right, so I'm going to write uh, the number of points on e. I'm going to write it as q minus a plus 1. So uh, this A is actually equal to the pairing of 1 and Frobenius, and this bound is saying that it's at most uh, 2 root Q. Or maybe it's twice the So A is just some integer. It's the, just the difference between this and Q plus 1. Not, uh, well, so the, the error term sort of comes from this Riemann hypothesis. Uh, and that's not really an elementary heuristic, but maybe it fits it into a larger context. So this error term is sort of equivalent to, I'm going to write it up in a sec, the Riemann hypothesis, but it's very much analogous to the one for prime numbers uh, in the integers. So uh, the next thing I wanted to say was that there's a, another interpretation for this, this number a, which is very useful. That's that A is the trace of Frobenius on the Tate module. And actually, given everything that we've already said, this is uh, just sort of a formal deduction. So there's the following general fact. If A is any 2 by 2 matrix, or any commutative ring, then the trace of A is equal to um, 1 plus the determinant of A minus the determinant of 1 minus a. 
Uh, that's just an algebraic identity. Just plug in the numbers and expand. And so we want to apply this uh, with A being the matrix of Frobenius on the Tate module. And so the left-hand side is what we want to compute. Last time, at the, at the end of the last lecture, we proved that the determinant on the Tate module is equal to the degree. So this side comes out to 1 plus the degree of Frobenius minus the degree of 1 minus Frobenius. And this is Q, and this is the number of points on E. And so this comes out to be A. So that, that's the proof. Okay, so now this is Riemann hypothesis that I just mentioned. Uh, so a definition first. Uh, a V number uh, of weight W, and this is with respect to our fixed Q, is an algebraic number, say alpha, uh, such that the absolute value of alpha is equal to Q to the weight over 2 for any complex embedding of the field of alpha. So for any embedding of this field, Q would join alpha into C. And so the one way to state this Riemann hypothesis is that the eigenvalues of Frobenius on the Tate module are they numbers of weight 1. And the proof of this, again, just kind of follows from things that we've done already. So the tape module is two-dimensional, so there's two eigenvalues, so let's call them alpha and beta. So then alpha times beta is the determinant of Frobenius, which is Q, and alpha plus beta is the trace, which is A. So if you look at the minimal polynomial for alpha or for beta, or maybe not the middle one, but it, it follows that alpha and beta both satisfy the polynomial t squared minus a t plus q equals zero. And so you can figure out what alpha and beta are using the quadratic formula applied to this polynomial. So alpha or beta is equal to uh, a plus or minus the square root of a squared minus 4q over 2. And now the important point is that the Hasse bound says that this thing on the inside, the discriminant, is negative. So this, this square root here, that's really an imaginary number. It could be 0. It's, it's on the imaginary line. And so that means these two roots are complex conjugates to each other. And then when you take the norm, you just square this and you subtract the square of that. So the norm squared of either alpha or beta just comes out to be Q. say what the zeta function is and sort of why this is called the Riemann hypothesis. So if you have any variety over FQ, then its zeta function, uh, which I'll denote by z sub x of t, is defined uh, as follows. You take the exponential 
of this power series. You sum from r equals 1 to infinity, you count the number of points in x over the extension f g to the r, and there's a t to the r over r. So it's sort of a generating function for the, these number of points over extensions. So the main theorem about the zeta function of the elliptic curve uh, is that it's equal to the following expression. In the numerator, you have it's a, it's a rational function, and uh, it is uh, 1 minus at plus t squared on top. 2t squared on top, divided by 1 minus t times 1 minus 2t. And the proof of this is also not hard, given what we know. So the number of points on E over this extension, just applying the point counting formula we did to an extension, is 1 plus t to the r. Uh, plus the trace of f2 to the r on the date module. You need minus the trace. And the Frobenius f sub q to the r is just the rth iterate of the Frobenius fq. So it's that fq to the r is just fq raised to the rth power. And so its eigenvalues are just the rth powers of the eigenvalues of fq. And so the trace is the sum of those two numbers. So this is just 1 plus 2 to the r minus alpha to the r minus beta to the r. And so if you look at the thing on the inside of the exponential, If you ignored this number here, the number of points, just at t to the r over r, that's the power series from minus log 1 minus t. And so if we put something in here like q to the r, that's just going to be minus log of 1 minus 2t. So since this is just a sum of, uh, since this thing here, the number of points is just some sum of exponentials, you're just going to get a sum of logs. So you have minus log 1 minus t from the 1, and then minus log 1 minus qt, and then plus log 1 minus alpha t plus log 1 minus beta t. And so when I take the exponential, it exactly says that the zeta function is 1 minus alpha t times 1 minus beta t over 1 minus t times 1 minus t. And the numerator just expands to what I had written. And this is why that previous thing was called the ring hypothesis. These numbers alpha and beta are the roots of the zeta function, at the zeros of the zeta function. And they have absolute value q to the 1 half. And that's sort of analogous to being on the real part 1 half line. So there's one more comment I want to make about point counting. So suppose that we have an isogeny between elliptic curves, e1 to e2. So it's an isogeny of elliptic curves over fq. So it induces a map on tape modules. TLE1 maps to TLE2. And uh, this map uh, doesn't have to be an isomorphism. Uh, but it doesn't have any kernel, and it has finite index image. Uh, the reason for that is. I mean, the kernel of f is finite, and f is subjective. So f is pretty close to being an isomorphism, so it's not going to mess up too much here. So in particular, that implies that if you tensor up with QL, this induced map is an isomorphism of, of vector spaces. And obviously, it commutes with the action of Frobenius, because everything's defined over fq. So that means that these things are sort of isomorphic two-dimensional representations of the Frobenius, so they have the same traces. So that says that the number of points of E1 is the number of points of E2, because you can recover the number of points from this trace. So this implies okay, 
trace of that Q on TLE1 equals the trace of that Q on TLE2. And this implies that the number of points is the same. So isogenous curves have the same number of points. And Tate proved the converse. Two curves have the same number of points, and there's an isogeny between them. Uh, but I'm not going to prove that. That might be a good topic for your arithmetic student seminar. Whatever it is. Oh, and one thing I wanted to point out about the zeta function. This right-hand side, you know every, I mean, Q is what it is, and then the only thing that you need to figure it out is what this number A is. So that means that if you know the number of points of E over FQ, you know the zeta function, and then that tells you the number of points of E over every extension. Okay, so one more thing about elliptic curves and characteristic P. So uh, let me assume now that I'm over just the general field of characteristic P. So I, I, as we said last time, since the characteristic is P, the multiplication by P map is not separable. Um, and it has degree P squared. So the degree is the product of two numbers, the separable degree and the inseparable degree. And since it's not separable, there is some inseparable degree. So the separable degree has to be a divisor of p squared and not actually equal to p squared. So there's two possibilities. So the first possibility is that the separable degree is equal to p. And this is the same as um, the p torsion over the algebraic closure, having exactly p points. And in this situation, we say that E is ordinary. And the other possibility is that, se is that the separable degree is 1. And this is the same as saying that the p torsion has no points other than 0 over the closure. And in this case, you say that E is super singular. not so bad. So uh, multiplication, think about multiplication by P on E. So that's an inseparable degree P squared. So according to something I said last time, since the inseparable degree is P squared, you can factor it first through Frobenius F P squared, and then followed by some other map F. But this first map here has degree P squared. So F has to have degree 1. That implies that F is an isomorphism. Not an isogeny, an isomorphism. And so, uh, since these two curves are isomorphic, they have equal J invariants. So the J invariant of E is equal to the J invariant here. But remember that you can compute the J invariant by some algebraic expression in the defining equation uh, for the curve. And here we've just raised all the coefficients of that equation for p squared powers. So that just pulls out. So this is just equal to j of e. 
to the p squared. And any number satisfying that lives in fp squared. And the corollary of this is that, at least when k is algebraically closed, um, there's only finitely many super simple occurs. That's because there's only finitely many possibilities for its chain branching over an algebraic closed field that curves determined by its chain. Okay, so that completes our sort of whirlwind tour through elliptic curves. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Not that I know. Uh, and I mean, there's a subtlety there, which is that the Jane Brain only tells you over an algebraic or closed field. Well, over, I mean, if you're over an algebraic or closed field, there's no like point counting to do, right? Because the number of points is going to be infinite. So if you're over FQ, I mean, you could have two curves that have a different number of points but have the same Jane Brain. So you can't really do that <laughs> as it works. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, uh, like over at P? In the very constraint. Yeah, I mean, you have the Hasse bound, and you know that it has to be a product of two cyclic groups. Um, I, I would suspect you could say something, but I, I don't know if like the exact answer is known. Um, I think that's probably overkill for doing this kind of problem. Yeah, I, I, I think you can probably say something, but I don't know exactly what the answer is. Okay, so now we're going to go to abelian varieties. So everything I say today is, mostly everything I say today is just going to be over the complex numbers. And then uh, next time we'll talk more about what happens over a general field. Let me start with the definition. An abelian variety is a connected and complete, complete being a synonym for proper, uh, group variety. So group variety just means group in the category of varieties. So it's a variety A, and there's a multiplication map like this, which is a map of varieties, and an inverse map, which is a map of varieties, and so on and so forth. So an example is an elliptic curve. This is a one-dimensional proper group variety. And in fact, those are all the examples in dimension one. So let me just explain why that's the case. Uh, if A is an abelian variety in dimension A equals one, then the genus in A is a curve, and it has genus one, so that's an elliptic curve. And uh, one way to see this uh, illustrates an important principle. Uh, so 
if you think of, say you have a one-dimensional uh, group variety, think about a cotangent vector at the origin. And using the group law, you can translate that uniquely to any other point. And so you can build a cotangent field, a one form, on the thing. And it's not hard to show that that's a holomorphic, that's a regular one form. So that gives you a, a trivialization of the sheaf of one forms. So it's a nowhere vanishing one form everywhere. So the group law implies that omega 1 is trivial. It's isomorphic to O. And I mean, on a higher dimensional Bielian variety, the same reasoning shows you that omega P for any P is going to be a free sheaf. So this says that uh, the global sections of omega 1 are the same as the global sections of O, and therefore one dimensional. And the genus is the dimension of that space by definition. Okay, so this is true over any field. Uh, from, from now on, for, for the rest of this lecture, we're going to need to be over C. So if A is an abelian variety, then the set of C points is um, compact because it's proper, and it's still connected, and um, you can think of it as a complex legal. So we're going to start off just by analyzing such things, forgetting about where they might come from. All right, so suppose that X is a compact, connected, complex Lie group. Uh, I'm going to let G be its dimension. And I'm going to write V for its Lie algebra, which is just the tangent space at the identity of X. And uh, there's a map called the exponential map, which goes from V to X. Uh, this is just some standard thing from Lie theory. It takes a tangent vector and sort of projects it along the one-dimensional um, one dimensional group along that tangent vector. So I want to go through a number of basic properties very quickly that happen in this situation. So first of all, uh, x is commutative. So really, this compactness is just forcing you to be commutative if you, if you have a holomorphic group law. And the reason for this Well, there's this map called the adjoint map. It's, uh, it's, it's how x acts on its tangent space at the identity. So if you imagine a little a tangent vector at the identity, and you imagine, say, it being represented by a little curve through the identity, if you have something in the group, you can conjugate by that element of the group and move the curve. And so that'll give you a new tangent vector. So the group acts on this tangent space. And that's what this is. That joint map tells you how x gives you an endomorphism of the tangent space. And so it's not hard to show that this is a holomorphic map. That's not really surprising because everything involved is holomorphic. Uh, and since so, so this is holomorphic, so add is holomorphic, um, x is compact, you know. And this end of v, v is a vector space, its endomorphisms just look like c to the n for some n. And so by the, um, I guess, maximum modulus principle, or maybe whatever it is in several variables, you can't have any holomorphic maps from something compact to something like affine like this. So this map must be constant. And of course, at the, when you plug in 1 at the identity in x, add is going to be the identity matrix. And so that means that this, I mean, it has to be that identity everywhere. So the action on v is trivial. And so that means that the, the Lie algebra is commutative. And that implies that x is commutative as a group. So this is not true if you just have a real Lie group that's compact. You can have non-commutative compact real Lie groups. It's very important that you're holomorphic here. OK, second fact. 
is that x is in fact the homomorphism of groups. And the reason for that, well, that's just true whenever you have a commutative group. It's just a fact about the exponential map. Oh, and I should say, uh, a good reference for everything I'm saying today is chapter one of Mumford's book. Uh, it's just called the Abelian Varieties. So he proves in detail everything that I'm going to say today. No, I mean just these assumptions. Compact connected, compact free group. Linear groups are usually meant to be affine, which is sort of the opposite of compact. Yeah. Well, for these kind of groups, it's constant. Uh, okay, so X is a homomorphism. Um, from that, you can see that X is surjective. And the reason for that, very quickly, if we say that U is the image of the exponential map, then since X is a homomorphism, U is a subgroup on the one hand. On the other hand, you know that the exponential map is locally around the identity of homeomorphism. So that implies that U is open. homeomorphism. And so if you look at the quotient, x mod u, well, since you use an open subgroup, the space is discrete. And since x is connected, it stays connected. So that implies that it's just a point. So it's the zero group. So x equals u. Okay, so once we know that, we can conclude that the kernel of the exponential map, so I'm going to denote that by M, so this kernel is a, a lattice in our vector space V. And the reason for that, well, since X is a local homeomorphism, the kernel has to be discrete. So X local homeomorphism implies M discrete. And since the exponential map is surjective, and this is the kernel, we know that X gives you an isomorphism between V mod M and uh, X. And so that says that M is co-compact, because X is compact. So it's discrete co-compact. That's exactly what a lattice is. And so, I mean, this basically just says that X is a torus. Uh, by which I mean it's isomorphic to some number of copies of the circle, S1. And the number of copies is 2G. And that just comes from the fact that it's V mod M. Maybe I'll write that. So X is V mod M. V looks like R to the 2G. And M is a lattice in there, so it looks like Z to the 2G. And, well, it's not some degenerate lattice, so this actually turns into S1 to the 2G. Uh, so from this, uh, you see that the N torsion in X is Z mod N Z to the 2G. Uh, just because the N torsion in S1 is Z mod N Z. You're just taking the 2G power of that. And finally, the last fact that I want to say is that we know what the cohomology, the singular cohomology of this space is. So the ith singular cohomology group is just a set of homomorphisms from wedge I M to Z. So the reason for that, well, using the Kunith formula and the fact that X is just a product of circles, you can see that the, the map from wedge I H1 
the HI as an isomorphism. And then since X is just a vector space mod M, the first um, singular homology group of X is just equal to M. So the cohomology group is the dual of M. Okay, so these are the basic facts about um, compact connected complex Lie groups. They're all just Tor. And so in particular, everything we're doing here applies to abelian varieties. So this shows that over C, abelian varieties are commutative groups and tells you what the n torsion is and all these things. Are there any questions? So it's going to be very important to understand line bundles uh, on abelian varieties and other things. Uh, so we're going to talk about them in this situation now. So line bundles on complex Tora. OK, so um, my x from now on is going to be a complex torus. I'm going to always write it as uh, v mod m. m is my lattice in the vector space v. So, uh, Associated to any complex manifold or algebraic variety, you can define a group called tick x, which is going to be very important. We're going to talk about it a lot in different situations. So uh, as a group, it's just going to be the set of isomorphism classes of line bundles on x. And it's a group under tensor product. The tensor product of two line bundles is a line bundle. I'm going to let k sub 0 of x in this situation, this isn't a general definition, uh, be the subgroup of line bundles which are trivial topologically. So these are all the holomorphic line bundles. It's possible that such a thing is trivial if you forget the holomorphic structure and just think of it as a line bundle of topology. And then, so this is a subgroup of this one. The quotient group is called NSX, the neuron severity group. So these are important uh, things associated to X. And since X is defined in terms of a, a lattice in a vector space, you want to know how do you compute these things just in terms of that linear data. And so there's a complete answer to that, which I'm going to describe now. So a definition, uh, a Riemann form on V is a Hermitian form H, such that its imaginary part, which I'm going to call E, takes integer values on the lattice M. So it seems like there's uh, some people include the condition that um, a Riemann form be positive definite. Some people don't, and I'm not going to include that condition. So I'm going to let uh, R, script R, be the set of reading forms. <coughs> and this is a group just under a sort of naive addition to add the forms point points. And then I'm going to introduce another group, script P. So it's going to be the set of pairs, h comma alpha, where h is a Riemann form. And alpha is a map from our lattice to uh, the complex numbers of modulus 1, which I'll write that u1, it's the unitary group u1, 
uh, which satisfied the following condition. So it's not quite a homomorphism, close. So alpha of x plus y is supposed to be e to the i pi times our form, or the imaginary part of the form, e to the diagonal of x and y, and then times alpha of x, alpha of y. So if this thing here weren't there, that would be a homomorphism. This makes it close to a homomorphism. And then I'll let p0 be just the set of homomorphisms. Uh, from M to U1. This is a subgroup of P. Oh, so P, I guess I should say, P is a group, um, sort of using that obvious group law. If I have two pairs like this, I add the H's and multiply the alphas. So P is an abelian group, P0 is a subgroup, and you can show that this R is the So these things are defined purely in terms of the vector space and the lattice. They're very linear looking things. So here's the theorem, uh, which is the apple humpert theorem. So it says there's a natural isomorphism from this thing I called script P to pick X. And this map induces isomorphisms from P0 to pick not, and then on the quotients, R to NS. All right, so I'm not going to prove this, but I want to make a few remarks about it. So here's sort of how you get a, a handle on, on understanding line bundles and x, sort of approach to proving this theorem. So let, I'm going to write pi now for the quotient map. This is what I was previously calling the exponential map. I'll call it pi now. So pi goes from d to x. So if, if L is a line bundle on x, so an element of pick x, then its pullback by pi is a line bundle on v. V is a vector space. It doesn't have any line bundles. So this line bundle is trivial. So it's just a trivial bundle. It's V times the complex numbers. And then this bundle comes with an equivariance under the lattice, since it came from something that was invariant under the lattice. And you can recover L from that equivariance. So L is the quotient of this pullback bundle, this trivial bundle, by the action of M. So the way that you can understand line bundles on X is to think about the trivial bundle on V and try to classify the equivariant structures on it. And that will tell you what all the bundles downstairs are. So using that idea, I'll tell you how you construct the map this way. So suppose we have one of these pairs, H alpha and our P. So using that, I'm going to define an action of this lattice on the trivial vector bundle over V uh, just by a formula. The formula is this. So I'm going to call elements of my lattice lambda. So lambda acting on a pair V comma Z. I just so in the first factor, I just add lambda to v. Then the second factor is something that looks slightly complicated. So first there's uh, this alpha evaluated on lambda, and then times e to the pi, and then I do h on v and lambda, and add to that h on lambda lambda, and then multiply by z. And so you can check that this formula defines an action. So an equivariant structure on V times C. And um, 
I'm going to denote by LH alpha the quotient bundle. That goes on X. And so this isomorphism here sends H alpha to this, this bundle I just constructed. So the hard part in proving this theorem is to show that this, you know, all actions look like this, or are equivalent to that. All right, so uh, a purely linear algebraic remark, which I think is worth making, is that there's a bijection between Hermitian forms on V So I'll call those summation forms H. And uh, alternating real forms, E, that satisfy uh, E of I times X, I times Y, is E of X, Y. So by an alternating real form, I mean it's a bilinear form. It takes real values, only real values. It's real linear. And alternating means that E of X, Y is minus E of Y, X. So this has nothing to do with the lattice M. This is just a statement about complex vector spaces. And the correspondence to go back and forth is, is easy. So you get E from H by just taking the imaginary part. And you get H from E just by this formula. You have H of X, Y is E of I, X, Y plus I times E of X, Y. And this is relevant for us because of this E that was coming in to the definition of the Riemann form. So we were thinking about the Riemann form in terms of this H and then saying that some condition on the E, but this E actually determines the H. So you can go back and forth between the two. And the important thing about the Riemann form, which is not true in general, is that it's integral value on the less. That's sort of the defining condition of it. So one last remark about this theorem. Uh, so if I have one of these H alphas, then I get a Riemann form, uh, then I get this E, the imaginary part of H. And like I was just saying, by definition, it's a, I mean, so by what I just said there, it's an alternating form, and it's integral valued on M. So this E I can think of as a map from wedge to M to Z. The alternating part means that it goes on wedge 2. So in other words, it's in it's an element of the space HOM wedge 2 M Z, which we had previously computed was H2 X. So there's another way to get an element of H2 X, starting with this, and that's to take the first turn class of the line ones with the lines. And these two things agree. So this equals the turn class this line bundle. And you can test if a line bundle is topologically trivial by testing if its churn class vanishes. So that's how you get the second part of the theorem. You see that uh, L is topologically trivial if and only if C1 equals 0. And that's the same thing as saying that E is 0. And that's the same thing as saying that H is 0. Okay, so this theorem gives a good description of uh, line bundles on our torus X. There's one more piece of information you'd like to know to complete this picture, though. And that's the following. So X acts on itself by translation. So if I have a point little x and x, I'm going to define P sub x to be the map Y goes to x plus Y. So this lets us define an action of x on pick x um, by letting x act on L, so a point in x acts on the line bundle L, by pulling back via translation. 
And we have this nice description of pick x in terms of linear algebra, and so we want to know how does that, how does this action look in that picture? And here's the answer. So if I pull back by translation the line bundle LH alpha, I get another line bundle, so it's going to be another LH alpha. The H doesn't change. And then the alpha just gets multiplied by e to the 2 pi i e of x with whatever. So this is supposed to be a function on m, so this is indicating how it's a function to plug in there. And again, a few remarks. So first of all, I just want to point out that um, mapping lambda and m to this quantity, e to the 2 pi i, e of x lambda, is well defined. So e is a, a pairing on the space v, but x is an element of the quotient. So to make sense of that pairing, you first have to lift x up to the vector space and then apply the pairing. You have to know that that's well defined. And it's well defined because if you pick a different lift of x, it differs by an element of the lattice. And e is integer valued on the lattice. So you do e to the 2 pi i times an integer and it doesn't change. OK, so that makes sense at least. OK, the second remark is that uh, a line bundle LH alpha is translation invariant. By which I mean its pullbacks are all isomorphic to itself if and only if h is 0. And you can see that. I mean, when I pull back by x, I'm changing the line bundle by this factor. And so it's translation invariant if and only if this e to the 2 pi i e x dash defines the trivial character on m for all x. Well, that's only going to happen if e is 0, which is the same thing as saying that h is 0. And so remember that this part of that apple humper theorem, I wrote h being 0 is the same thing as saying that you're in pick naught. So this is translation invariant is the same thing as being in pick 0. And then the last thing is that uh, if you look at pull back LH alpha, and then I tensor with the dual of LH alpha. So I can compute this by just sort of doing addition in that script P group. Since the, so when I pull back, the H stays the same. When I take the dual, the H turns to negative H. And so when I add them, the H's go away. And I just get left with this thing here. That's the difference between these two things. So there's two observations. First of all, that's in pick naught because the h part is 0. And secondly, it's a group homomorphism in x. If I change x to x plus y, it just adds on the right hand side. So this shows that for any line bundle, so any line bundle you can write like this. So for any line bundle, the map uh, from so the x maps to px star of L defines a map, or really a group homomorphism, from x to pick not of x. And this group homomorphism I'm going to call phi sub L. OK, so uh, the next thing maybe to say something about is sections of these line bundles. 
you have these very nice parameterization of line bundles, how can you find sections of them? So uh, I'm going to introduce a term, a theta function. So this is res with respect to the data h alpha. There's a holomorphic function, theta, defined on our space V, I'm just taking values in C. So it's just an ordinary holomorphic function defined on the whole space, which satisfies uh, a certain functional equation. And that's that you want um, theta of v plus lambda to sort of scale like uh, what I'd sort of previously written up there. Uh, so you want alpha of lambda and then e to the pi h d lambda plus pi over 2 h lambda lambda. And this is for all v and v and lambda in the left. And the basic proposition is that the space of um, global sections of this line bundle H alpha on our torus is just equal to, or naturally isomorphic to, the set of theta functions. And the basic reason why that's true, if I have a section of LH alpha downstairs, I pull back to V, my bundle, be, the line bundle becomes trivial. So I get a section of the trivial bundle. That's the same thing as a holomorphic function. And then, I mean, you can't, not every holomorphic function upstairs is going to descend to a section. You have to interact with the equivariance in the correct way. And that's exactly what this functional equation is telling you. So this kind of thing is common, by the way. Um, we have some quotient, V mod the lattice M. So if you looked at things which are just invariant under M, so if you had theta of V plus lambda just equal to theta of V, right, those obviously descend to functions downstairs because they're invariant by the group. And it's very typical that if you put in some kind of scalar factor up front, depending on the lambda and maybe where you are, that will descend to a section of some kind of line bundle. So the reason that this is a useful perspective is because I mean, now you just have functions on a vector space. Yeah. That's what I was saying. Um, by if you have a section downstairs, you can pull it back to V and get a section of the trivial bundle to find everywhere. And then that's just going to be a function. So the usefulness of this perspective is that you can kind of easily construct and study theta functions. You can write down just explicit infinite series define them analytically and define theta functions. Um, and so that lets you construct and analyze them. And using that, uh, Lefschetz proved the following theorem. This bundle, L of H alpha, is ample if and only if H is positive definite. So it's not hard to show that if H is not positive definite, then the bundle's not ample. Um, if H is kind of degenerate in some way, then you're not going to have enough sections to define the embedding. The other way is a little more work. So there's some remarks or consequences of this. So first of all, this shows that um, our complex torus is a projective algebraic variety if and only if there exists uh, positive definite Riemann form. Right, your projective algebraic variety means that you have an ample bundle. All bundles of the form are of the form L H alpha. And this is the criterion for those things to be ample. And so you might worry that, well, maybe you could be a proper algebraic variety and not projective, but that can't happen. So, in fact, in this situation, if x is algebraic, then it is projective. And so it, it has one of these h's.
Uh, this result actually can be refined some. If h is positive definite, then in fact, the third power is very ample. Or any power higher than three. And then finally, let me just do a little example. So if we go back to the elliptic curve case, so a one-dimensional complex torus, our vector space V, we can, it's one-dimensional, we can take it just to be C. And as I discussed, discussed last time, the lattice, we can assume that uh, one is a standing element of our lattice. We can assume it's spanned by one tau. So this is what a one-dimensional torus looks like. And you can define a Riemann form as follows. So I'm defining a Hermitian form on C. So it's going to take in two complex numbers and be sesquilinear, they say. So x times y bar divided by the absolute value of the imaginary part of tau. So that's obviously positive definite. And just a tiny, short, little easy computation shows that if you look at the imaginary part, when you plug in lattice vectors, you do get an integer because I divided by the imaginary part of tau. And so this is a positive definite Riemann form. And so that shows that this one-dimensional complex torus is algebraic, which we already did that last time. That, that's how it fits into this picture. A any questions? All right. So I'm going to write, so suppose that I have two tori. I'm going to write hom xy with a set of holomorphic group homomorphisms from x to y. And I'm going to call an element in here. F is an isogeny. So we defined this last time for maps of elliptic curves. The definition was that it was a non-constant map of elliptic curves. The definition in general is that it should be a surjective map. It's an isogeny if f is surjective and the kernel is finite. So this gives you an equivalent definition in the case that x and y are elliptic curves. And we call it the degree of the isogeny is just the size of its kernel. And an example, so as in the elliptic curve case, the first example of an isogeny is multiplication by n. So this is an isogeny, and uh, when I was first listing the properties of complex story, we computed the size of the n torsion, which is the size of the kernel of this. It was n to the 2g. So this is an isogeny of degree n to the 2g. Remember here, g is the dimension of x. So in the elliptic curve case, it's n squared. But as you go up to higher things, you get bigger degree. So I, I want to now talk about the dual torus. So I have some complex torus x, v mod n. So I, I'm going to define a, a, a different torus called the dual of x. And I'm going to present it again as a vector space model lattice. So the vector space is the sort of conjugate dual of v. So v bar star is the set of um, conjugate linear maps from V to C. So scalars pull out with a complex conjugation is what that means. And then I'm going to define uh, a dual lattice, MV, to be the set of guys F and here, such that their imaginary part takes M 
the integers. And then I'm going to define the dual torus to be the quotient. So it's relatively easy to see that the double dual is back to the thing itself. So the name dual does make sense. So the dual is uh, functorial. So if I have a map of tori, then there's a map the other way, from y dual to x dual. Uh, that's very easy to see. Uh, if f is an isogeny, then so is f dual. And they have the same degree. But you can do better than saying that they have the same degree. In fact, their kernels are dual to each other. Here by dual, I mean in the sense of finite abelian groups. So that's like the Pontryagin dual, the Haman to Humanzi. So this is not very hard to prove. I wrote it up in the notes, but I think maybe I'll skip it and just read it there. So an, an application of this that is important to say, though, if I take x equal to y, when I take f to be multiplication by n, uh, then it's true that the dual to this is also multiplication by n. And so this says that the n torsion in x and the n torsion in x dual are dual to each other. So there exists a canonical pairing. n torsion in x times the n torsion in x dual to, well, it goes to from this theorem, you'd say q mod z, but they're both n torsions, so they go to z mod n z. And that's secretly the nth roots of unity. And this is called the bay pair. So if you remember on an elliptic curve, we talked about this last time, the bay pairing was on the n torsion of the curve and itself. And here, you don't get that. You have to use the dual variety in one slot. And that's a reflection of the fact that elliptic curves are self dual, which maybe I'll say a word about in a minute. So we define the dual torus as this quotient by kind of taking our lattice and our vector space and just dualizing them. And that's a kind of very convenient definition and it's very easy to work with. Uh, but it's, I don't know, it doesn't give you such a good interpretation of what the points of the dual mean. Um, but there, in fact, is a very nice interpretation. Uh, the dual is just picked up. There's a natural isomorphism from the dual torus to pick not x. And let me just very briefly sort of say what the construction is. If I have an element of this conjugate linear, conjugate dual space, f in there, then I can build uh, a map from m to u1 by sending an, a lattice element here to uh, e to the 2 pi i times the imaginary part of f on that element. So that's a homomorphism. And it takes values in u1. And so this is uh, exactly what an element of that script P0 was. 
So this is an element of what I call P0, which we said was isomorphic to pick knot under the apple humphrey theory. And then just by definition of what the dual lattice, M dual was, those things uh, give you the zero homomorphism here, because they're going to be integer valued there. So this descends to a map from V bar, uh, v bar dual mod M dual uh, to pick knot. And that quotient was exactly what we, how we defined this. So this descends. So maybe I'll call this alpha f. So f maps to alpha f descends to a map from x dual to pick knot. And that map is the isomorphism. And so this is, so if you remember uh, last time with elliptic curves, we said we constructed this canonical bijection between an elliptic curve and the zero part of its class group. And there's this correspondence between divisors and line bundles. The class group is exactly the same thing as the card group. They're isomorphic by that correspondence. And so that thing together with this is sort of a proof that elliptic curves are self dual So I guess I'll say one more thing today. I'll just define what polarizations are. So suppose that H is a Riemann form on our V. Then if I take an element of V, I can build this functional on V. So I think of V fixed and think of assigning, you know, plugging into the second slot here. And since H was a Hermitian form, I'm going to say it's conjugate linear in that second slot. So this gives an isomorphism between V and this conjugate dual space. Oh, sorry. It's an isomorphism if H is not degenerate. You know, H could be zero. That's allowed. But if H is not degenerate, this is an isomorphism. And it clearly takes the lattice M to the dual lattice. And so it descends to a map of tori. And I'm going to call this D sub H. And if you remember, we, uh, when I was talking about the Picard group, we had this map from x to pick not x, if we had a line bundle L, we could build this piece of L. And these two things here are isomorphic by this theorem. And the square commutes if L is the line bundle attached to H and whatever alpha. So just two ways of thinking about the map to the dual. So a polarization is a map from x to its dual of the form phi sub h, or phi sub l, uh, where h is positive definite. And if you remember by Lefschetz theorem, that's the same thing as saying that l is ample. And if H is positive definite, it's not degenerate, so this is an isomorphism. And that means that on tori, this map is necessarily an isogeny. So a polarization is an isogeny. Necessarily an isogeny. And we say that it's principal if the isogeny has degree one. So a principal polarization is an isomorphism from X to a stool of this form.
And so these things arise naturally when you look at Jacobians. So we're going to talk about the Jacobian of curve later. That's going to be a, naturally a principally polarized abelian variety. And one, the, one thing that's nice when you're in that situation is you have a size morphism between X and its dual. And so the vague pair, and you can think of it more like an elliptic curve case just between the torsion and itself. All right, does anyone have any questions? All right. Next time it'll be more abelian varieties, but over general fields.